Yes, so, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the TCTAP 2024 uh, bifurcation session. So, in this session, we're going to talk about the new concept of bifurcation PCI. I am BK Gu from Seoul National University Hospital, and it's my pleasure to co moderate this session with the Professor Adrian Benning from Oxford. And we have uh, uh, experts, as uh, invited experts as a panelist Dr. Jesok Be, Dr. Andrea Ogulis. Dr. Nils Ramsey Holm, Dr. Ho Lam, Dr. Yoshinobu Murasato, and Dr. Chang Wong Nam, Dr. Chun Yashite, and Dr. Gerard Warner. So without further ado, I'd like to start the first session. And the first speaker will be Dr. Scott Harding, and he's going to talk about the left main versus non-left main provisional stenting, whether there's a difference. Uh, Dr. Harding, please. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to give this talk. So I do have some disclosures. Okay, I think it's very clear that the left main bifurcation is different to different uh, other bifurcations. Uh, it's a larger vessel. Um, the uh, branches are important in almost all cases. Um, the B angle or the bifurcation angle is generally larger. Um, there's more calcification, um, there can be more uh, fibrosis, um, particularly at the circumflex ostium. Also, if we look at the geometry, the geometry is different. So here you can see on the top, uh, left main bifurcation and then the LAD bifurcation. So in the LAD D1 bifurcation, we tend to have more of a parallel type um, bifurcation. And, and what this means is that we're more likely to have a narrow carina tip uh, angle, more likely to get carina shift. But actually, when you have this parallel um, type arrangement, the actual osseal area is larger um, than when you, uh, when you have a perpendicular type. In the perpendicular type, um, you're more likely to get plaque shift uh, and less prone to uh, carina shift. So there's definitely some differences. Um, we know that um, the LAD is always important, that the um, circumflex subtends uh, more than 10% of the myocardium in 90% of the cases, so almost all cases. Um, whereas for non-left uh, main bifurcations, only one in five or 20% subtend more than 10% uh, of the myocardium. And that's by CT estimate, and CT estimate probably overestimates um, the myocardium um, subtended so it's probably less than one in five. So one of the important things is um, what happens if we leave significant disease behind? So the circumflex, as I said, is an important vessel in most uh, cases. And this is interesting data, again from Korea, uh, where they look at uh, patients who had FFR of the circumflex uh, and didn't have intervention. And if you were left with a low FFR, you can see the event rates at uh, five years were very, very high. Um, so it's very, very important that when we're treating left main disease that we do not leave significant uh, disease behind. We know from many registries, and this is just one, uh, this is the coronary bifurcation stent three registry from Korea, that all these registries show worse outcomes for left main bifurcation versus non-left main bifurcation. Uh, and probably one of the reason, important reasons for this is the area subtended by the left main compared to uh, some of the other uh, things. It may be that uh, some of the geometry, et cetera, plays a role, um, but we really don't have any data on that. Uh, so again, what this is mainly driven by is uh, target uh, lesion revascularization. So one of the titles was uh, talking about PCI complexity. And when we talk about complexity, uh, what we want to know about is not only uh, uh, the anatomical set setting and the relevance of the branches, but the disease extent in the two branches. And of course, the definition criteria are probably the best validated criteria for what is a complex bifurcation and not a complex bifurcation. So to get into definition uh, trials, you had to have a true bifurcation to start with. And then for left main, 
you had to have a, a side branch diameter stenosis more than 70% and a side branch lesion length more than 10 millimetres. And for non um, uh, distal left main lesions, it had to be 90% uh, uh, stenosis and 10 millimetre uh, disease in the side branch, plus two minor criteria. And what they showed is that a two stent strategy was uh, uh, significantly better than a one stent strategy when you had this complex disease. This has subsequently been validated in left main, uh, and you can see that actually the, when you had complex left main bifurcation group, uh, a two stent strategy uh, was significantly better. Uh, DK crush, again, uh, randomised patients to a, a provisional versus a two stent strategy, uh, left main, and uh, showed a benefit for uh, a two stent strategy. And when you divide that into complex and simple lesions, the biggest benefit was in complex lesions with a marked reduction in TALF at one year. And these benefits were sustained out to three years. Of course, we do have the EBC main data uh, where uh, randomised uh, patients with left main disease uh, to a provisional, uh, stepwise provisional or a systematic dual uh, two stent uh, strategy, which showed non-inferiority at one year for the provisional approach. Importantly, the disease in uh, EBC main was less complex than it was in DK crush five. So significantly longer side branch disease in DK crush five and significantly higher syntax scores in DK crush five. Uh, and out to three years, there was uh, a signal that there was reduced target lesion revascularization with a provisional strategy at EBC main. And again, there are a number of other trials which I can't talk about through time, but uh, which have shown a variety of results from uh, superiority for the two cent strategy to neutral effects to a uh, superiority for a provisional approach. One of the things I do want to talk about, because I think this is one of the most important pieces of data to come out around bifurcations in the last year, is the October trial and a data on unintended stent deformation. And one of the things that was surprising is that 9% of cases had unintentional, unintentional stent uh, deformation identified. And when you looked at the left main, 19% of cases uh, had unintentional stent deformation. These were good bifurcation operators. And of course, that sub difference between left main and non-left main were much more likely to get unintentional stent deformation because one of the important mechanisms is guide catheter collision, and you're not going to get that in a LAD D1, um, and abluminal wiring being the other one. So I think this is an important thing, and when we're doing complex uh, left main bifurcation, two-step bifurcation, uh, we're more likely to get this, and we really have to pay attention. So in conclusion, the left main is different. Outcomes from left main versus long normal left main PCI are worse, but I think this mainly reflects the large amount of uh, jeopardised myocardium. A provisional stenting strategy can be utilised in a majority of complex non-left main bifurcations as few side branches supply more than 10% of the myocardium. A stepwise lab provisional approach and for the left main was shown to be non-inferior to an uh, upfront two stent strategy EBC main. And I think it's a very reasonable thing to do in uh, non-complex left main. However, I think the data, in my view, in complex left main lesions is very reasonable to use an up French two-stage two strategy. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Scott, for the excellent summary. And we're going to have a discussion after having four talks. Next speaker will be my comment reader, Professor Adrian Benning from Oxford University Hospitals, UK. And he's going to talk about the PAT, whether it's simple or not. Please. Thank you very much. So my job today is to try and make you think about your pot. Um, I think it's probably one of the most underestimated contributions to bifurcation treatment, and we've become rather complacent and blasé about it. So I'm going to try and talk to you about what pot is, the theory for pot, where and when to do pot, including procedural pot, and also to talk about repot. But the key issue is that in a bifurcation, the proximal vessel stent should end up being bigger, proximal to the bifurcation, than after the bifurcation. And to do that, you need to do a pot, and the pot needs to be appropriately positioned and appropriately sized. 
The balloon needs to be placed just proximal to the carina, where it is designed to optimise expansion in the main branch. And done properly, it will push struts towards the side branch orifice, as you see in this cartoon. By doing that, it increases the area in the proximal vessel and reduces malapposition. Using pot during your bifurcation procedures is also an excellent way of preventing guide wire tracking behind the stent during recross, one of the mechanisms of longitudinal stent distortion. So done properly, this is what a pot looks like. As you can see, the main vessel stent is very much bigger than the branch, and there is some scaffolding, as you see at the origin here. So that when we optimize the deployment of our single stent in a provisional approach, we have full expansion with no metallic narrowing, no malapposition, excuse me, I'm sorry, I'll go back, and a nice big orifice. It's fascinating when you look at the cartoons of pot and look at where the balloons are placed. Many of them are in the wrong place, and that's in two dimensions on a cartoon. Importantly, we have to try and do it in three dimensions with the heart moving. Surely we need to spend some time making sure we have the right size balloon and we put it in the right place. Because ultimately, these diameters have to be different. So if I can't decide where to place the pot on a cartoon, how can I possibly expect to place it in the right place in someone's coronary artery? And the other thing for you to remember is you must always make sure your stent is long enough to allow the pot to be done safely so that you don't end up injuring the vessel here because you haven't got enough coverage to allow pot to be done properly. Under dilating the main branch proximally is not the thing to do, so please don't pot too distal. How many pots should you do in an optimal clot? One, two, three, or four? I won't take a vote, but the answer is four. And this was nicely shown by Professor Murasato, who showed the importance of making sure that we cross in the right place and that that will help optimize the expansion of the stent if we do it properly. So then the optimal clot, you can see the position of the pot balloon in these cartoons, and that allows us to get the right approach. There are two pots in an optimal DK crush. So what's repot versus pot and final pot and procedural pot? Well, we know why we kiss, and we kiss to prevent and recreate the carina and prevent carina shift. And this is one of Professor Ku's slides. The carinal shift here, over dilatation beyond the side branch, has shifted the carina to, to narrow the vessel here. We don't want to do that, and that is a risk that we need to avoid. On the left-hand side here is a snake that swallowed a porcupine. That is a bad idea, but so is over dilatation of the proximal vessel as you end up pulling the stent away from the ostium here and causing a proximal mal edge malapposition and a bottleneck effect. So we need to size our pot appropriately. And we have to recognize that when we kiss, we often end up with an oval lumen rather than a round lumen. And as you see here, the oval lumen is less optimal, has a uh, lower area stenosis with a higher ellipticity index, and there are malopposed struts. So leaving our double stent technique with just a final kiss and no final pot is not the thing to do. Pot side repot is a way of trying to treat bifurcation disease with sequential inflations, which has been championed by Francis Derrime. He showed in this initial study that by using uh, this sequence, he could get pretty good results. I would, pro I would point out that to me, that final pot balloon here looks rather distal. But he's gone on to do the Cabriolet study, and in this study, we see that 500 patients, of whom 174 had complex bifurcations, got pretty good results with this technique. But it is absolutely crucial, if you're going to do this, that you make sure that you're tangential with the uh, bifurcation when you deploy your pot finally and try and make sure that you don't distort the ostium at the end. So, what are the issues with that if I don't do it properly? Well, the issues are, as we've hinted at, that you end up creating an, an osteostenosis and you end up closing 
the office will branch off. The whole thing that you wanted to try and avoid in the first place. And these data come from Wellington showing the risks of that. So to do it properly, we can inflate the side branch, we inflate the main branch, we do our kissing balloon, we carefully position the, re the pot and the repot, and we end up with a stent looking like that. No malaposition, no metallic narrowing, adequate side branch opening, hopefully some protrusion to the struts of the side branch if the wire cross has been accurate, and the proximal repot here has restored the circularity of the proximal main branch, which is what determines the prognosis of the patient. So the take-home message is, the pot actually needs some thought. You can't just use the same balloon to go up and down 48 millimeters of stent and expect that you've done the pot properly. I'm afraid that's not true. The vessel wasn't three millimeters all the way down to begin with. It shouldn't be when you've finished. The result of the main branch is terribly important particularly if that main branch is the left main. Thinking about the pot should be part of every bifurcation interventional technique, particularly including single stents, and we must respect the fractal geometry. In any two stent technique, using procedural pot will reduce the risk of abluminal wiring, so why wouldn't you do it? And the final message, if you're doing final pot, don't pot too distal, pot proximal. Uh, thank thank you, you, Adrian, for the very you know, excellent and straightforward uh, talk about the pot. So next speaker will be uh, Dr. Mamas Mamas from Kew University, UK, and he's going to talk about the novel PCI strategy for side branch disease. Dr. Mamas, please. So thank you for inviting me to a great meeting. Uh, my focus is going to be really isolated side branch disease. I think that's something that perhaps we don't talk about um, often enough. I have no relevant interests um, to this talk. So how common is isolated side branch disease? Is it important? Well, we do have some data. This is data from patients undergoing cardiac catheterization. And you can see that isolated side branch disease occurs in about 3% of all cases. Now you may say, well, okay, it, it's not very common. Why, why, why have a talk about it? Well, the reason we have a talk about it is that you know these patients have significant event rates. You know, this is a stable population, and yet the MACE rate is about five percent a year. And actually, if you look at the prognostic impact, having an osteal isolated lesion is associated with a, almost a two and a half fold increase in MACE. This is data that we've published. Data from the Ultimaster Registry, a contemporary um, drug eluting stent platform. 4,000 patients undergoing PCI for bifurcations. And you can see, again, isolated side branch disease was found in about 3% of cases. Now, this is not benign. And the reason it's not benign is if you look at the Kaplan-Meier curves, you can see that in terms of target lesion failure, cardiac death, clinically driven target lesion revascularization, it's highest in isolated side branch, much higher than 111 lesion. So this is important. We also see that perhaps experience may factor into this. Those that do very little side branch uh, PCI have much worse outcomes than centers that do much higher levels of side branch PCI. Now, one of the reasons may be that it's rather difficult to treat these cases. And the reason being that often trying to um, spot stent the side branch is not ideal, and it's not ideal for two reasons. Firstly, it's not ideal because you may have geographical miss. And secondly, it's not ideal because if you don't have geographical miss, you may compromise the main vessel. And you can see that this problem is not so acute when the bifurcation angle is 90 degrees um, to the main branch, but as it becomes more and more acute, you can see that it becomes more problematic, particularly as your side branch vessel size increases. Now, that, 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 those sorts of considerations have driven many people to think, well, okay, maybe we should be uh, treating these side branch um, lesions with two stents, you know, rather than trying to spot stent with a single stent, should we be adopting a two stent approach? And this is um, Korean data from the Bifocat uh, Registry of Bifurcation Lesions. This is purely looking at um, the side branch um, isolated lesions. And you can see that really there's no significant difference in MACE between a one and two stent approach. And really, as time has progressed, we've really moved away from a two stent approach to a one stent technique in this patient population. Now, 
People have tried to address these problems around geographical mist by introducing these um, novel um, stent platforms, the Capella stent. This was a stent maybe I don't know, 10 years ago that I was using quite heavily in Manchester. This was a nitinol self-expanding stent and was very good um, for those side branches with a 90% um, angle. But again, similar sorts of problems in those cases with a very acute angle. It didn't work very well. And it was only bare metal, so it has been discontinued. And these are some pictures of the Capella stent. Of course, there is another method of treating these bifurcations. Um, this is one case that I did, um, an isolated diagonal. Um, and in this case, you can see at different angles, very tight diagonal, patient symptomatic, admitted with an acute coronary syndrome. I used a cutting balloon, good result with the cutting balloon. I used a magic touch with an excellent final result. And really, you know, I think nowadays a lot of people are increasingly, increasingly using drug-coated balloons. And this is some data. Um, it's a small registry of only 45 patients. Um, but I think it still shows that at 12 months, the MACE rates are acceptable, you know, one MACE event in 40 patients. So I think for non-left main um, osteal side branch disease, I think, you know, using a drug-coated balloon is certainly favorable. And certainly these MACE events are much lower than we observed in the Ultimaster registry of over 4,000 uh, patients. The other thing to think about when faced with a side branch is actually should we be doing it at all? Um, we know that the highest event rates and the patients that are more likely to get clinical significance are those with a significant ischemic myocardium, those with a um, percentage of greater than 10%. This was shown um, by one of our earlier speakers this slide. And again, it shows that actually for non-left main lesions, less than 20% of patients have a uh, a blood supply of greater than 10%. So for most side branches, they don't really meet the criteria of the 10% cutoff. And this is important because then you get into the whole question of physiological versus anatomical significance. I guess you may have a pressure wire significant lesion, but if it only uh, subtends 5% of the myocardium, then perhaps we shouldn't be doing PCI at all to that lesion. And again, this is really nice data from uh, South Korean colleagues showing that um, the length of the side branch is probably a very good predictor of um, a, a side branch that will portend to greater than 10% um, um, mass of the myocardium. So anything greater than 73 millimeters is likely to supply greater than 10%, whereas something less than that, even if it is physiological significant, you can probably leave it alone and manage it medically because I think the benefit in those sorts of patients will be relatively small. So I think in conclusion, isolated side branch disease accounts for about 2% of all disease and 3.5% of all bifurcations. I think the one thing that I really want to take away from this is doing PCI to these lesions with stents is associated with poor outcomes. These patients have really poor uh, TLR rates, cardiac death rates, and in the ELT Master Registry, it was the strongest predictor of MACE and cardiac death, even much greater risk than 111 lesions. I think for left mains, um, you know, very different story there, but we should consider anatomical versus functional significance. There really isn't difference between one versus two stent approach in treating isolated side branch disease, but for not left main lesions, I think the first line should be drug-coated balloons, particularly given uh, the high MACE and target lesion failure rates with um, drug-coated stents. So with that, I'd like to thank you. Thanks, Mamas. So certainly uh, one of the first things one learns doing left main intervention is the rule of Kang, as we call it in the UK, the 5678. The next talk is the rule of 5678 for bifurcation PCI. Is it time to change in 2024? A young man, Arne, is going to talk to us on that. Thank you. He's not there. Or maybe he's not. But Arne is with some interview with SA Park, so we, we may change okay, the schedule. So we, may, we may start discussion. Okay. So until you can. Okay, so that the, we have a discussion time around 15 minutes, uh, 10 to 15 minutes, so that any question and comments will be welcome. 
Perhaps I'll start off just by asking Mamas, um, Mamas, do, do zero, zero, 001 bifurcations really exist? I mean, if we image the main vessel, isn't there always disease? I agree, I agree with that. I mean, some of Gary Mintz's classical work would, su would support that. Um, but the fact is that most people don't image bifurcations and report um, the data angiographically. And angiographically, they do exist. If we image, though, I suspect that it's probably much rarer. Of course, then you have to balance what's physiologically significant versus what's anatomically significant. So often, in the case that I showed, it was negative FFR down the LAD. Should you be treating the LAD, though, in, in that sort of setting? First, do no harm, I guess, is one of the things. But, Andrea, well, how do you do it? Yeah, it's wonderful lectures, and it's really great. And I like very much because we should not mix left main and other bifurcations. If it, I was a power, I would never to allow to do that, actually, in one session, because it's a completely different animal. But I, I am slightly <laughs> disagree. <laughs> we had a fantastic lecture, but but when we founded the Bifurcation Club, it was in 2004, and that time we was really encouraged to, to really do um, imaging yes. in the settings like this. And as you as you showed very well, that this is of course it's quite rare. But you always but you are facing with those, and you need to understand what to do. And I'd say no, it's not the truth because it is quite often that there is practically no plaque, especially in, in LADs and diagonals. Yeah. It is not like, it is completely different. It's of course, if you look on proximal LAD and left main, that usually, or 90%, there will be the plaque even more. Yes. But uh, I guess that uh, it is not uh, really true, because by imaging what, what I see, in it is usually not, uh, not, uh, I mean, 100% um, that the plaque also will be in, 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 in main vessel. Uh, may, may I, um, as you are standing, uh, okay. make a comment uh, regarding the FFR. You said uh, FFR and we need to think about the territory. Yes. But the thing about the FFR is that the FFR physiologically takes into account the territory. So the same degree of stenosis of the di diagonal one will result in another FFR than the diagonal three. So the diagonal three will not be significant because the concept of FFR is the subtended myocard. So we can rely on FFR for the side branch. It will not lead you to a treatment of the diagonal three. But, but even considering that, that the, if you have a very small disease subtotal occlusion, FFR will be low. So in that case, I'm wondering whether the PCI is really needed or not. Yeah. Yeah, but it's yeah, uh, so it, it, unlike... Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. That's, I, I understand what you mean, but... The, of course, yeah, sure. this is true. We, if the FFR in the last diagonal branch yeah. gives a significant result, but conceptually, I think we can trust the FFR. I sort, of, the, I sort of agree with that, but, I mean, if, if you, you may still have a positive FFR with a, a, a less than 10%, um, diagonal subtending less than 10%, and I would question... Um, the utility no, no. of revascularizing those cases. Yes, it's not. The 10% yes. rule is not yes. there, of course, in yeah. the concept yes. of FFR. Yeah. Yeah. But that there, the la that's like yeah. uh, when we do FFR in a donor vessel. Yeah? yeah. Well, that subtends myocard from another area. So it's always the combination of what is subtended mm. uh, plus the lesion. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, Adrian, you, you mentioned about the importance of PAT, but the, you know, today we've been reviewing all the IBUS OCT trials for bifurcation lesion, but there was no optimization criteria about circularity or the ellipsis. So, and they mainly focus on the MSA. So, that, do you really think that the, that, you know, elliptical shape ended up with bifurcation matters in the end, or the MSA will be enough. I mean, the MSA is, is, is probably enough. And I think one of the things we have to recognize is that uh, many of the patients that we're treating, we never end up with anything that's nice and round. But I think it's an important point for us to remember that as we become more confident to bring our stents into the left main, that unless you use a balloon that is dedicated to the size of the left main, you will not expand the stent 
either with your kissing balloons mm. and you'll end up with an oval uh, shape with uh, malapposition north and south, which is really not the right thing to do. So I, I think it is perhaps more of a theoretical worry, but I think as, a, as an aid memoir or something for to be thinking about, yeah, frankly, the case this morning, they used a 3.5 balloon all the way back to the main, and the main was a 5. Um, so it, you, you have to use a balloon that's appropriately sized and an appropriate length to do the pot correctly. Yeah. So I think it's uh, not only the stent area, but also stent deformation, also important. Because uh, distribution of a stent strut is not even sometimes. If you do the KBT by putting effect by balloon, Sometimes deformation at the carina site, no stand zone happens like this. So not only the stand area, but also the stand formation is very important. So you mean that the drug concentration and drug illusion? Right, right. So, so Neil, so that the, have you ever analyzed that kind of you know, kissing inflation and the pot inflation, MSA versus elasticity on the OCT guided PCI bifurcation? <clears throat> No, so not systematically in terms of predicting outcomes. Uh, so I don't think we at this time have any you know, relation between the, uh, the symmetry and, uh, and the outcomes in large vessels. So if you have a well-expanded vessel from the first pot with adequate size pot balloon, if you then do kissing, yes, you might get a bit more elliptical, but you still have a very large uh, vessel at that time. So adding an additional pot afterwards, we don't have any evidence you know, to that, but uh, in terms of, of e events. But we do have evidence that if we have caused uh, stent deformation by guiding catheter collision or whatever, uh, balloons that we have advanced, then that certainly affects the outcome. So we need to correct that. So in the left main, the pot has other, you know, purposes than just to make it more round shaped. Yeah, just, just to repeat that point, that, and that's probably the, more li the likeliest time that the guy catheter stent interaction occurs is probably recross and, and the kissing balloon. So particularly if either you're not imaging or you're imaging but not looking, then, then the port is the way to try to get around that. Yeah, but um, I'm mean, honestly, again, guys, you are talking about left main, but left main, it's more or less clear. Actually, I guess it's for us, it's much more important to talk about actually uh, bifurcations again and I'm completely again that we should know to put the myocardial mass and actually necessity and then, and, and of course I completely agree. And, but Nils, you also remember when we, when we did um, imaging analysis, we seen how after kissing balloon actually, we really changed geometry. And that's also was one of the points where we start to use a pot much more. And, yeah. and as you had then mentioned about this fractal geometry. Yeah, I would like to a, emphasize that the importance of pot if you do the pot in LMT adequately, uh, not, uh, like a guiding cast correction, that will happen. Because uh, if it's attached to the stand, to the vessel, guiding cast is uh, no dangerous like this. So the number one predictor of guiding catheter collision is when you have a wire, a jail wire and yeah, a luminal yeah, wire. Yeah, then right. you have a wire on both sides of the stand and the guiding catheter will you know, be attached to the to the edge of the stent, so each manipulation will distort the stent. So even though we have a really well-expanded stent, if we still have a jailed wire, we will manipulate the stent. So, so I think you know, getting rid of the jailed wire as soon as possible, if we do more complex uh, bifurcation, is very important to, to uh, you know, accommodate that problem. So preventing abluminal wiring, do using procedural part, mm -hmm. and or imaging your wiring before you act upon it, is the way to prevent that. Um, perhaps I could ask Professor Murasato about uh, 001. Oh, there's the one. Oh, there's the one region. Uh, we also conducted the uh, image, uh, bifurcation study uh, under the complete imaging guidance in Japanese bifurcation registry, uh, which uh, also uh, conducted a similar uh, result. The other one region has one year mass, the significantly higher rate. Uh, so. Uh, such uh, the one region accounted around 3%, and uh, in this region had a moderate region in the uh, proximal left main, uh, proximal member cell and distal member cell. So 80% oh, of the case uh, stenting from the member cell to the uh, distal uh, uh, member cell or side branch. 
so uh, crossing over stenting and the two stent performance is more frequent compared to the non true bifurcation region. And the final kissing balloon inflation rate is very similar as the 111 region. So the treatment is very similar as the 111 region. So, however, pot is less. So that is a uh, problem. Uh, so the there's the one region angiographically non-significant uh, member studies. However, there is a plaque burden, and uh, only uh, uh, the stenting or uh, treating in the side branch is uh, uh, damage in the member cell uh, plaque. That is uh, another reason uh, for the frequent uh, TLR or uh, vascular outcome. Yeah, so there's always endless debates when we talk about the bifurcation PCI, especially 001 lesion. And for the sake of time, so we have to move on to the next uh, part, so that if we have extra time, we're going to do another discussion. So next case, master case presenter will be Professor Do Yung Gang from Asa Medical Center. He's going to talk about mini crush. As he had uh, another duty just after his talk, we're going to have a short discussion after his case presentation. Thank you, I'm Dr. Gang from Asa Medical Center. Today, I will talk about the mini crush technique for bifurcation PCI. I know that the last, uh, this part is that the showing the case with uh, some technical issues, so I will concentrate on the how to do the mini crush very well. The, the left side is the crash called crush, and the right side is the mini crush that has the minimal protrusion to the main, main vessel of the side branch stent. And this is the table of the data about the mini or nano crush technique and its outcome. Then the clinical outcomes at the one to five year TLR rate was the very low in perfect study and the a bit high in the previous the MITO study. And the mini crush technique in Asa Medical Center is based on the data. That the first is that in our pre-combat two and perfect study, the side branch osteum was the atlas heel of the two stand technique. The most recall was occurred in the side branch osteum. And second is that the, this is very well known picture, the bigger minimal stand area is associated with a better clinical outcome, especially in the left main PCI. And we have revised, maybe Dr. Ahn will present it later. The, in left main crush stenting, the bigger MSA, was well associated with the better clinical outcome. So the key is that the, to treat the side branch osteum very well, and second is to, to obtain the bigger minimal stent area after stenting. And the, what would be the indication for, the, is, this is not only for the crush technique, but for the two stent technique. It, as the, that Mama said, everyone said that the most cases can be treated with a crossover with a provisional approach. However, sometimes we need two stand technique that for that we should learn and experience and practice for the good two stand technique. It is the DGG side branch with a relevant side branch with a large territory that makes symptom or the vital sign, uh, the, the unstable vital sign should be treated usually in the left main bifurcation and the, some big diagonal or some big OM branches that can precipitate symptom. It can be less than 20%, but such kind of the 20% of patients should be treated. And for two-step bifurcation technique, I use the intravascular imaging mandatory. I will throw OCT anything, and it enables a bigger minimal stand area with a safety and detect acute complication. In left main 10-year follow-up study, even very long-term outcome was better in IFS guided PCI group compared to the angiograph guided PCI group. And this is the case, 73-year-old male patient, stable angina, the RCA intermediate, FFR negative, and deferred. And right side, uh, left side, there is a severe stenosis on the left LAD, and FFR uh, the 0 0.71, uh, and the diagonal branch, big diagonal branch, was severely diseased. And you can treat it with the, the, the balloon and trocot balloon and, pro, and the treatment of the just the distal to the bifurcation. However, when we evaluated the image, there was severe disease up to LAD osteum 
and the diagonal branch was very, very severe diseased, and the territory was large. So I decided to treat this patient with a two-stand technique. And then most important thing is the aggressive pre-lesion modification, especially in the severely calcified lesion. I used the 2.75 NC balloon and side branch and opened the all. And then side branch was tented uh, the, with a 2.75 by 23 millimeter drug eluting balloon. And crush balloon, I evaluated IVUS and the evaluator vessel size and prepared 3.5 NC for crush. And for side branch stenting, for I prepared minimal protrusion for mini crush. And for that, the multiple projection, of, for example, LAO cranial for diagonal branch is needed. And after stenting, the important thing is that aggressive side branch proximal optimization before crushing. The open side branch ostium with the NC balloon as wide as possible for larger side branch space for rewiring. And it enhanced easy rewiring and balloon introduction and it minimized the risk of the abluminal wiring and minimized the risk of the stand gap at the bifurcation. So I applied 2.75 NC up to 24 ATM all the size was based on the intravascular imaging. And uh, compared to conventional crush, the proximal side optimization enhances the optimal treatment of the side branch. And then to the balloon crush with a high pressure with a 3.5 NC, and check the whether the stain is well crushed and balloon is covered. And the main branch stenting, after that, important thing is the optimization with, of the main branch stand with the NC balloon. It can be done with a pod or just NC balloon anyway, but by the imaging, intravascular imaging based, where optimization of the proximal stand is important. With this step, we can avoid abluminal wiring or the proximal stand deformation. And then after these steps, rewiring is usually easy because we have opened a lot of the side branch ostium uh, without even the uh, decay, the double kissing, we can easily do the rewiring and balloon passing. I have used the used 2.75 NC balloon with a balloon anchoring. And then sequential high pressure balloon inflation to obtain sufficient stand cross sectional area. And then final kissing, we don't need high pressure, it's just for the put the carina in the appropriate space. And for the kissing and the, this step, adequate balloon size is important for optimal outcome. Small size balloon make under expansion, malposition, especially at the POC area. And this is an example that the left main 3.5 and 3.0 NC kissing was done. It's large enough. However, in IVUS, there was a gap and malposition at the POC area. So after IVUS review, we applied bigger, 4.0 and 3.5 NC, and then you can see that the carina is well placed with the, without marrow position. In angiographically, we cannot discriminate. In intervascular imaging, there is some difference. And finally, imaging surveillance and further optimization uh, if needed, and it can make the procedure perfect. And this is the final angiography. So in summary, intracoronary imaging is the key for the successful two-stand technique. A large opening of the side branch stand ostium and the main branch optimization warrants easy side branch rewiring. And balloon anchoring is helpful sometimes as 10 areas obtained by sequential high-pressure balloon. And final kissing balloon is to place the carina in the right place. Final imaging surveillance and correcting suboptimal result guarantee the favorable long-term outcomes. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gao, for the very excellent case and the review. So that the, uh, I have one, one question or comment. So that the, you did mini crush, not DK crush. You did kissing, no pop. So how, how you reconcile with the you know, previous talk and the, your current strategy yeah. about the DK crush and pop? Yeah, for DK crush, uh, I think that DK crush is very good technique, excellent data, and excellent outcome. However, it's a little bit too time-consuming and too 
a little bit too balloon consuming. So we are updated our mini crush technique with the side branch optimization and further dilation of the side branch, and then we could get a good result with a shorter time consumption, so and, and less the balloon consumption. So we are now doing our crush technique without decay. However, we would need some comparison data of the, our technique to decay uh, if feasible. And second, the part thing, uh, actually we are not routinely doing the part. I agree with the concept of the part, and, uh, but however, for two-stand technique, we can do it with the intravascular imaging guided big balloon inflation and the final kissing balloon, I believe that we can obtain uh, enough big uh, stand area in Pioche area. So, Adrian, any further comments about that issue? I think what, what I liked was the emphasis on the dilatation at the weak point of the, of the bifurcation, that twice you made sure that you'd expanded the side branch ostium. First, when you uh, put your first stent in, and then again with sequential balloon inflation. So I think that's the weak point that people, again, don't spend enough time on. So I thought that was, that was great. But how much, when you say mini crush, it's a mini, mini, mini crush, huh? <laughs> how, many, how many millimeters do you expect? Are you trying to make it absolutely flush? Uh, actually, what I hope is that the 0 0.001 millimeter, or <laughs> but it's not feasible. And uh, actually, it is not to uh, not, uh, try that to produce too much is a little bit dangerous yeah. because we can lose the region. So, the trying to uh, trying to make a mini or nano is not important. Just the important thing is that not to lose the disease side branch. I believe. Thank okay, you. So thank you, Dr. Gam, for the excellent presentation. Thank so you. please, you can go now. And then now go back to the uh, Dr. An's presentation. So that they now welcome Dr. An. And he's going to talk about the new changes in previous 5, 6, 7, 8 rule. Thank you, Dr. Gu. I'm sorry I'm late. So the, my topic is rule 5, 6, 7, 8 for bifurcation PCI. Time to change. So the PCI optimization is very important. According to the optimized why not, the patient outcome is different. But uh, do we have uh, optimization criteria for left and PCI? Previously, Dr. Gang published data, five, six, seven days, very, very easy to memorize the minimal stand area, five or four, circumflex osteum, six or four, LAD osteum, seven, POC area, eight, left main. But uh, look, at, uh, look at in detail, this, this criteria based on the very heterogeneous population, the simple crossover stenting 289, and the two stand is uh, 114, of those, 99 is crushy, 15 is T-stenting. This study nicely demonstrated that if we achieve the, the minimal lumen area, minimal stand area like this, full expansion, even though the crush technique or two-stand technique, long-term outcome would be very nice. But there is some problem, because heterogeneous population, that in addition, the POC area, minimal stand area measurement is not easy. Anyway, thereafter, two, two more, the uh, left main uh, optimization criteria has been su suggested, exit criteria, spin register criteria. So uh, last year, we analyzed our regist as a medical center registered data. What is the optimization criteria for stand, two stand only, two stand uh, crush technique only? Last, uh, last 14 years, the we ignored the 479 patients treated by the two-stand technique and excluded the other technique. We only included the patient, the 292 patients treated by the two-stand crush technique. We measured the osteum of LAD, circumflex osteum, this left main, and they measured the minimal stand area after the crush technique. This is the distribution of minimal stand area for this left main 10.8, the LAD 8.0, circumflex osteum 5.8. According to the this, uh, minimal stand area for this left main, and osteum, osteum of LAD, and osteum of circumflex is associated with the maze. Particularly, the left main, the less than 11.8, 
64%, 888.3 is 55%, 5.7 is 48%. The smaller minimum stand area is associated with a higher risk of maze or cause death. But the left main, is, left main minimum stand area is not associated with the long-term outcome, but LAD and circumflex minimum stand area is significantly associated with their long-term outcomes, even or cause death. So we classified, we grouped the group, group three groups. Group zero is a no under expansion. Group one is a one under expansion in either side of LAD and circumflex. Group two is a both sides under expansion. Only patients with both sides under expansion, LAD and circumflex is associated with a higher risk of maze or cause death and myocardial infection, target lesion device radiation. So if we avoid the worst scenario, losing the both branch, then we can get a good long-term outcomes. So optimal result would be the getting the so optimal result of the LAD and circumflex osteo, even though if we can get the one side optimal result is associated with the good long-term outcomes. Then how about the provisional standing? So last year we also evaluated the minimal stand area after provisional simple crossover standing. 879 patient, uh, 829 patient, the mean age is 64. We measure the proximal left main, this left main, LED osteo. So minimal stand area median number is 11.6, 9.9, 8.5. ROC curve analysis demonstrated that the proximal left main minimal stand area cutoff value is 11.4, nicely associated with the long term outcomes. And this left main minimal stand area 8.3 is also associated with the long term maze. And LED osteo minimal stand area is also associated, cutoff value 8.2 associated with the long term outcomes. I also grouped the three different groups, no under expansion one under expansion in the osteum of LAD and this left main, or both under expansion LAD or this left main. Similar to the bifurcation stenting, both under expansion patient is associated with worse clinical outcomes, or even or cause death, myocardial infection, target lesion device radiation. So this is our new IVUS MLA MSA criteria for bifurcation stenting. This criteria 5, 6, 7, 8 is based on the nine month ISR data. But nowadays, the new criteria is based on the five year MACE data. One simple crossover stenting, proximal LAD, this lamp main, proximal lamp main, proximal lamp main is 8, 8, 11. Two stenting for circumflex osteum, LAD osteum, this lamp main is 6, 8, 11. So simply 6, 8, 11 is another criteria for one stenting, two stenting. So this is my summary. Intracoronary imaging has an important role in left main PSA optimization. Imaging itself is not associated with better outcomes. Additional effort for more optimal stenting based on the coronary imaging may lead to the better stent and patient outcomes. Five, six, seven, eight was based on the nine month ISR and would be the minimal requirement. New criteria 6, 8, 11 was based on the five-year maze would be the target goal to achieve. Thank you for your attention. So thank you. So Dr. Ham, please, so that the, you're going to have a short discussion time for your lecture. So Adrian, any thoughts? Fabulous data and the Assam Medical Center leading the way again. The problem, one of the advantages of single center data is it's likely you did the same thing over and over again because you will probably do it the same. Why did you end up with such, in the cases where you ended up with a suboptimal result, could you go back and see the pre-imaging and work out why that happened? Or did they miss a step? Or how do I make sure that I don't end up with a suboptimal double stent expansion? Yeah, that is a good question. So that is the, our next step, the, to predict the, uh, how to get the optimal result. That will be the next step, so I will, uh, I will uh, uh, tell you the next meeting. But in your, so in your, in your practice, when you, uh, just tell me roughly what you would do. Do, do you image after pre-dilatation routinely? Yeah, uh, sometimes I did the imaging full back the two, uh, three times, four times, 
five times to check the full dilatation of stand or pre, uh, region prepare, check the region preparation first and after stenting and high, after high pressure balloon dilatation and final surveillance at least three or four times uh, imaging surveillance during the left main PCI. I've certainly had a couple of times to use lithotripsy after stents, which makes me feel bad because it makes I didn't do it properly, I think, but I've done it and seemed to get away with it and felt that it was probably better to do the lithotripsy than to leave it as it was. But uh, uh, you know, it, it comes to good imaging. Gerald. Yeah, the, it's very impressive, uh, the deduction of the values, but it's uh, a Korean population. So the transfer to other populations, other t uh, sizes of people, is difficult, I think. That's why uh, I would like to have a relation between the size that you achieve and the plaque, uh, the residual plaque load that could be something transferable to other populations. Did you do any calculations about the residual plaque load in these different uh, regions? Yeah, this is a very important question. So I, 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 I do lots of analysis. So what is the more important than the others? So stent expansion, residual plaque, et cetera, et cetera. But the final, the remaining, the one important uh, predictor was uh, minimal stent area. So, yes, it is not easy to apply to the other uh, ethnic groups because different uh, uh, body, sh body size or something like that. So, this, uh, uh, the taking lesson from this uh, the analysis is that uh, there is some goal and try to uh, make effort to get uh, such a goal. This can make the better clinical outcomes. Okay, Scott. Thank you. So um, there was analysis from the XL trial which basically came up with exactly the same numbers, right? So that's a European population. So it was 11 in the uh, left main, it was 8 in the LAD, and it was 6 in the circumflex. So uh, your numbers uh, were exactly the same as the uh, analysis from XL uh, for optimal stent sizing. Thank you. Yeah, great colleague. Okay, so thank you. And let's go back to the case. Adrian, please. So the next case is TAP Technique for Bifurcation PCI, and Young Bin Song from the Samsung Medical Center is going to present that for us. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Young Bin Song from Samsung Medical Center in Korea. Uh, today, we are going to talk about the uh, T and protrusion technique or TAP technique the straightforward and uh, useful provisional stenting technique for bifurcation PCI. So let me start with the case. Uh, a 70 year old male was admitted for exceptional chest pain and coronary CT angiography showed that the uh, suspected left main lesion and echocardiography showed that the normal LV ejection fraction without regional warm motion of abnormality. His past medical history includes hypertension and paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. So, diagnostic angiogram showed that the uh, 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 severe distal left main stenosis and LAD osteal stenosis, as well as uh, the circumflex osteal stenosis. There is some uh, moderate stenosis in proximal circumflex artery. And there is an, uh, RCA had no significant disease, and the epicranial view showed that the, uh, the mild plaque in mid LAD. So, uh, I think uh, this case is uh, definitely distal left main true bifurcation lesion. So, my initial plan was uh, elective two stand implantation. As you can see here, uh, there are a lot of options, so you can pick anyone, whatever you like. But uh, personally, I prefer the tap technique. So I think the, the, the best two-stand technique is the one you are most familiar with. So I'm, I'm a big fan of tap technique. So my initial treatment strategy uh, is elective two-stand uh, implantation with the tap technique for this case. Uh, TN uh, protrusion or tap standing technique is a provisional uh, bifurcation standing technique. 
in which the side branch stand uh, is placed uh, protruding, protruding slightly into the main branch so that the uh, side branch osteum can be uh, fully covered. Uh, it is best uh, when the side branch is small or large bifurcation angles. And this technique has several advantages over others. Uh, it's easy and fast and no loss of wire access to main branch during procedure and no multiple stent layers and no crushed mangled stent. The only disadvantage I think that uh, leaving a small neocarina. Uh, I will show the uh, tap stenting uh, technique step by step and in step one the, ste uh, the both branches are wired and then uh, stand main vessel with a jailed guide wire on side branch. And step two, the uh, side branch was rewired and then uh, kissing ball inflation was performed. And step three, uh, uninflated balloon uh, is uh, advanced into main vessel and then the uh, side branch is positioned at the side branch osteum. Actually, uh, this is the, uh, the most tricky point of uh, tap technique. Uh, we, we have to carefully position the side branch stand edge at proximal side branch osteum border to ensure full coverage of side branch osteum. And step four, inflate the side branch stand while keeping uninflated balloon in main branch. The side branch stand protrudes into the main branch only at the distal edge of the side uh, branch osteum. And then a uh, full side branch stand balloon slightly in, uh, back into the main branch and then uh, kissing balloon angioplasty was performed. That's it. <coughs> it, it is the uh, tap stenting technique. The, this is our final result and kissing balloons modifies the angulation of side branch stent stroke protruding into the main vessel to create a small single layer neocarina. So uh, let's see uh, how uh, this all uh, works in our patient. Uh, the both branch uh, was, uh, were rewired, uh, wired, and then 2.5 by 20 millimeter balloon was performed at both branch. And then uh, 3.25 by 33 millimeter DS uh, was implanted at left main to proximal RAD with a jailed guide wire on circumflex artery. Then circumflex artery was rewired and then kissing balloon angioplasty with the 3.5 and the 3.0 millimeter balloons was performed. And advanced uninflated balloon to RAD, then position, uh, uh, carefully positioned circumflex stent edge uh, at proximal circumflex osteum border at uh, ensure full coverage of osteum of circumflex artery. Uh, in this step, uh, optimal angiographic views of the side branch osteum should be obtained, and then stent augmentation tools is extremely helpful for uh, successful teeth stenting. Then a 3.0 by 24 millimeter DS uh, was implanted at left main to proximal sock while keeping uninflated balloon uh, in RAD. Then kissing balloon and plastic with, uh, uh, was performed uh, with a stent balloon. Then we performed the, the IVUS. So as you can see here, there's a very uh, minimal, minimal uh, stent of protrude the main vessel and the stents were uh, well expanded and well opposed. So this is the final result. Okay, this is my summary. A TAB is an easier provisional stenting technique compared to others and can be considered uh, for smaller side branch or larger bifurcation angles. TAB is a modification of teeth stenting with slightly protrusion of side branch into main branch to get full side branch osteum coverage. Uh, it's uh, a very uh, technically straightforward and does not result in loss of wire access to main branch during procedure, uh, does not leave uh, multiple stent layers and or crush the mangled stent. 
uh, the only uh, cabbage are uh, living a small single layer neocarina, uh, which can be minimized for a small side branch or large bifurcation angle. Thank you for your attention. One of the great things about bifurcation uh, angioplasty is everybody has an opinion, <laughs> and we love to talk about it, and you've got a great result. And TAP is a, is a great uh, technique for bailout. I think it's probably my choice of bailout. I probably wouldn't use it electively in the left main, just because if you don't get it quite right, then it can be quite difficult. And where you put the stent, I mean, it's different if it's a right angle, but when it's like that, making sure you've got enough but not too much, and you can't do a pot, really. You can only do a, a very proximal pot because you don't want to put the pot balloon in. And I'm always a bit anxious about putting the... Uh, imaging catheter down the, the side branch as well in case I pick stuff up because once if it doesn't go right it can be very difficult to unpick yeah. um, but it's, it is the perfect bailout technique I think when it's big diagonal yeah so this tap was more than perfect but the, I really hate to do a ibis after tap because it's always protruding a lot <laughs> so I try to you know let, make a kind of very small protrude but the ibis large protrusion so do you have any tips and tricks to avoid the over protrusion of the side branch step during that? No, no, I have no <laughs> tips, but, uh, but I'm always the, do the best to optim, uh, the optimal, uh, find the optimal site. So uh, uh, currently many labs have uh, the stent visualization uh, the progr uh, program, so uh, stent, uh, stent booster is very helpful. Uh, Part of it is knowing where the marker of the balloon is relative to the stent. Mm -hmm. And certainly, yeah, uh, if yeah. you put the, the marker and the balloon on the wire, you're probably about right uh, for most stents. Comment? Yeah, I think that, uh, as a moderator said, that the bifurcation angle is very important. Uh, perpendicular type is okay for doing the tau, but uh, like a parallel type, we should not do this technique, maybe. Yeah, so I totally agree with your opinion. So. Uh, if it, the bifurcation angle is less than 60 or mm -hmm. 70, yeah, you, you, we don't uh, recommend the tap technique. So, Dr. Shite, what is your preferred, you know, rescue strategy? So, if mm -hmm. it's a one stenting provisional and if you need a side branch stenting, what is your routine strategy? q lot or the Yeah, I think crochet? the type of uh, parallel type would prefer the q lot stenting because uh, it's easy to get the opposition in this type. We usually do the 3D OCT guided PCI, and uh, easy to see the recrossing point by the kilo stenting. If you do the WDK crash like this, 3D OCT is difficult to see the recrossing point. So we usually uh, only do the DK crash for the perpendicular type like this. And in that case, would you have done the circumflex first? Stent to circumflex first, then LED? Uh, it depends on the uh, morphology, I think. Well, <clears throat> after having uh, <clears throat> imaged consecutive cases with TAP, I'm a, a bit concerned with that technique. Um, it's, you know, we have stent straws all over the place in many cases. Uh, final pot is really a problematic uh, thing to add in this technique because if you have a long metallic carina, you will re-jail your side branch. Uh, we know that is related to increased mortality. Um, I, it's so difficult to, uh, to nail this uh, based on angiographic assessment and uh, you should be ready to, you know, to convert it to a crush technique. You can crush the proximal part and then rewire and then uh, perform kissing balloon inflation. Um, it's, just, it's just the experience for really high volume operators that have done a lot of tap cases still it, 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 it looks difficult. I recognize the good results in non-left main cases that have been published in series, but just looking at, at, at the results uh, from an OCT point of view, it, it, it's less than optimal. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. So our final case is from Andre Erglis, who, as you know, works in Latvia, and he's going to present a 001 case. And... Uh, 
Usually, Andreas has a, has a surprise for us, so I look forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for so kind um, um, invitation, and uh, thank you for coming me here. And I knew that actually, we, we, we because I'm last speaker, it's always very short. That's why I showed just the case. And and um, thank you very much for all speakers and uh, actually panel for a really great discussion, and especially Professor Mamas Mamas, who actually showed the whole theoretical part of of uh, zero zero one bifurcations. And uh, that's why I show just this uh, case, and uh, it, is, it is absolutely right. It's not so easy to find cases like those, and uh, I'm really happy that uh, I borrowed this from my colleague. She's also here, Eva, and, and she's a great operator, and um, it was uh, quite recently done. And it's actually not so recently, <laughs> three years ago, but why, why I want to say a couple words, because I grew up in uh, in era when this was a balloon angioplasty, and, uh, and, and also the, one of the sentences was don't touch diagonals. And, and this is, a, you know, the, because we had no idea how to fix a problem if, if you have uh, uh, real dissections. And, um, and I guess that, you know, we, if we are getting older, usually people going back to childhood, and I guess I am in this study, and, and, and as, uh, what we really want to do, it is as simple as, as, uh, as possible, but Again, we are facing with, with big uh, side branches, with important side branches. I'm not talking now about how we can, how we can prove this by different kind of uh, or, or um, invasive FFR or uh, comp uh, computed CT FFR or by, by different kind of, uh, of, uh, of uh, myocardial examination, but actually, of course, there always will be there some cases where we should to fix this. This is a um, real, uh, this is a man 73 years old and with progressive, really progressive uh, um, angina. And if you look on CT uh, angiography, you will see later on the, the high calcium score and subtotal occlusion of um, uh, OM1. And there was stage invasive procedure, and here you see this uh, this case. The calcium scoring is uh, 282, and uh, there's some bit of lesion in LID. And 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 uh, as I said, this is a stage procedure. The, uh, the right was done before, but still 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 um, uh, pain. And as you see here, uh, there was very well to see also calcium. And I'd say I. When Mama showed this case, I, I remember how we started with that, because actually, if you have very good result with, specifically with, uh, somehow with um, a balloon, which is not a plain balloon, then it's always very difficult to understand what should be the next step. And I also, we created a study also at that time with a very good my, a friend of mine from Germany, Stefan Hoffman, and the idea was that we could, and that, at that time they started with the uh, coated balloons and then and, and to, to do this with scoring balloon plus the eluting balloon. But of course, it's always a question what we then to, to should do and how we can to, to make this uh, procedure because, of course, this is a very reasonable question about, this, about plaque in, in main vessel. Okay, but in this um, uh, particular case, it's done like uh, in, in similar way what uh, Professor Mamas Mamas showed. It is done for so cal uh, calcified lesion that, as you see, there's a two bands. This is sometimes not so, uh, I'd say, um, uh, favorable for imaging, but we do a lot of imaging, but not in this case, unfortunately, because it was not done in, in this case. And there was, a, as you see, also the, for, uh, with escalation, starting with uh, cutting balloon 2.75, 6 millimeters, which is very easily to go uh, sometimes through the bends. And of course, it's, you, you need a good, uh, good uh, catheter backup, but, but it is uh, what we do in our uh, lab. Then after plaque treatment, and there's a couple options. And as I said before, we, this one option is to leave like it is. The second option, of course, is to, to use some metal and also um, DCB. But um, we have a program for, for many years, and this is interesting, and especially to, to mention that I should say that it is very important about the, about the because you just discussed about the markers for stent markers, and then, of course, it is not easy to put this in. But uh, for Magmaris, this is a marker of, of stent. 
uh, of scaffold or stand is a bit uh, behind this, uh, this uh, balloon marker. And then the uh, Magmaris was, uh, was uh, deployed in, in 3.0, was deployed in, in, uh, in the vessel, and uh, with, with good implantation time, it is important. And this is uh, what you see after, after um, stent implantation. And then, of course, this is, but this is, we do 95% in our lab, and it's also based on our data and other data, but it's some um, 25 years ago that with non-compliant balloon, even with the same atmospheres and the same size, you can get uh, around 10%. MSA, which is important, and of course I will not touch discussion because I also grow up with music style criteria, but this is, uh, I completely agree that uh, the other thing is that how important is, is actually um, symmetry index, which was at least in 90s very popular. Okay, then it is, uh, then it is the final result, and, uh, and as you see for this calcified lesion, uh, this is good preparation, this is a uh, result uh, quite acceptable. Pa patient uh, didn't come back to, to, to Angio because uh, he's, uh, he's uh, doing very well, no any um, symptoms of angina, and uh, he's going for, for stress tests. And, and there is, a, there is a, which is important that he also g get a very, very aggressive, um, I guess with PSKI-9 or, or something like that, aggressive lipid lowering therapy, which is, and as you see, it is also a really important thing, and this uh, LDL is 0.9. And the discussions point, of course, I, I, I want to put this optimal medical therapy only, provisional death or two stand strategy DCB or BRS, BRS in, 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 in meantime, especially in future. And in conclusion, the careful and brave black petite and its main goal to achieve a good long-term follow-up result. Of course, do not hesitate, use more aggressive tools, cutting, scoring, now it's uh, IVL, others, but uh, of course, then in, only in case if you intend to finish procedure with stand or scaffold, otherwise it is uh, sometimes goes with, you know. And if plant use uh, DCB, then try to avoid dissections, and that's what I've seen very well in, in, in this LED, um, LED uh, diagonal, uh, I mean, um, uh, case. Important step is to cover rostral part of bicofession, what you mentioned all uh, before, and no rush for stent positioning. This is really important. And 001 bifurcation treat treatment is feasible with BRS, and in some point even very recommended because of, and you know, we are now following to green agenda strategy, leave nothing behind. That's why I guess that in future it will be even very politically important thing. Thank you so much. <laughs> I was slightly surprised your colleague didn't put a wire down the circ. And part of the reason that I, I remember that, when you said about don't treat the diagonal, I remember 20 years ago, four o'clock, needed to be finished by five, osteal diagonal lesion. I thought, be, be quick. <laughs> Why the diagonal? Inflated it with a balloon, dissection all the way back to the left main, <laughs> terrible pain, STs everywhere, managed to rescue the LED with three stents, but lost the dag. <laughs> so I went to see her the next day and I said, how are you? And she said, oh, oh, oh. I said, the pain. I said, yes, I'm the pain. I said, it was terrible pain. I said, yes. I said, was it like your angina pain? She said, no, my angina pain is over here. <laughs> so never treat the diagonal. <laughs> and if you are going to treat the diagonal, two wires. Um, it, it's definitely the way forward. Some comments for Andre. You know, no, uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, again, I completely agree. And um, as I said, there is a really depends on, um, how to say, when I was uh, up to 10 years, uh, my experience, it was somewhere in 2000, we started with, with, uh, with left main. And then I did, I, I thought that I am so good that I can everything to do with one wire, because actually otherwise you are knitting, and what I see very well on, 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 on. But uh, actually I completely agree that you, you can be in safe, uh, in safe uh, more safe um, side if you do that. But, in, but it is also really depends on, um, no, I, I agree that it could be, but for, yeah. But you know, if you are winner, that you should not penalize. Come in here. Uh, I have a one question. That uh, did this uh, protruded 
uh, bioabsorbable stent into the main vessel disappear in the long term? No, not the main. In several, no, it, it disappeared actually in uh, this, the new, 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 this, um, I mean, the um, biotronics, this magmaris, and now the biocell of stents, they disappeared somewhere in six to eight months. Mm -hmm. And this is a very, very, how to say, promising technology, because oh. I guess for bifurcations, it will really, really to solve all our thinking about what we know to, to, to talk about mini crush or a bit deeper or top or other, but even if you leave some struts inside the, the main vessel, mm -hmm. the struts will disappear in, and another and says about the price, and uh, I just confirmed, and, and this is, a, now in meantime, it is okay, it is twice, um, um, the DCB is twice cheaper than this, uh, this scaffold. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I guess the end of the day, if you count all together, then we, I'm not so sure that, uh, the, the, you know, because with DCB you should sometimes should put other, especially in, in the, at least it is one of the things what I wanted to show us, think about that, and that's it. It is interesting to see your, you know, listen preparations of scoring Berlin followed by the Cutting balloon. Oh, no, this is not. I, I said that we, we try to do a study about scoring balloon. Oh, no, no, okay, no. Yeah, this okay. is done uh, just with cutting balloon. <sighs> Actually, we with Cleveland, we did a study, and this is uh, somewhere we put in one, one book we published this, and, and actually, it is not the same. Scoring balloon and cutting balloon is not the same. And this is uh, for different, for different uh, lesion uh, morphologies, yeah. Just tell us, because I know you're a fan of the cutting balloon, tell us which. Which balloon you use in for which indication? This is a quite strange because uh, it is so far. I don't. It's not now. I guess the last uh, two years they, they switch indications. But the, the only one contraindication for cutting balloon was the calcified lesion, which is you know it was so strange. But um, but um, uh, actually, you see, it's one thing if I use, but we have around. We, 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 in our institution, we have 4,500 um, PCIs, and there are the 15 uh, operators. And sometimes, even for me, it is like because I, I should look also on budget. That the people really like to use if it, they see a calcium because it is so quick and so easy to use. But of course, for 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 very and and now we have also we do a lot of later, But for very calcified lesions, now we have this. IVL and specifically for for left main, I guess this is a, also with IVL we are now in in better in better situation if we have for two stent strategy two metal stent strategy um, um, the stenosis which was not in past. That was great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. As always, the bifurcation uh, session is always great. Uh, well attended and great enthusiasm and great participation. So I thank you all for your attention and uh, enjoy the rest of TCTAP. Thank you very much.